we go. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Probably hundreds of people on here right Man, now. Man, I hope not, because this is not our best show yet. I'm on newbies. What are you on? I'm going on industrial. What okay. Do you want? Newbies. Okay, we got some bodies on newbies. Good. Good. Yeah. You gotta turn that audio off so we can stop listening to how big a dick weeds we are. Yeah. Two minute. Two minute. Just stretch. Yeah, I can almost look right. What's up, guys? Scars. One oh one. One one one. Frank Tomaszewski's in. He is. Yeah. That guy's awesome. My favorite neighbor. Yeah. Do you ever see uh, Dave across the street? Yeah. Do you? See him occasionally out there walking his gun. Walking his gun. <laughs> Larry Adams coming in from LaGrange, Missouri. Yvonne Gensler, Larry Adams, three other people. We got some people coming in. Cigars and Guns is in. What's up? Start sharing this thing. We're about rocking and rolling. Minute 20 left. We're going to tell you why cigars are more expensive than the others and help you not succumb to spending too much money on a cigar. What should I smoke? I brought all these to talk how about. How many cigars do you have? It looks like you grabbed For, a top 20. In the show prep, I decided that we were going to do a show on the different sizes and shapes. To which we did. And you just blew that we out We just of the did water. it. If you want to know about sizes and shapes of cigars, check out our previous show, which we did. Exactly yeah, I'm going to have to check it out because I don't even remember doing it. You were there. I don't think so. What's up, Sean Rats? What's up, Robert Stanley? 44 coming in. Juan Mendoza, Gold Leaf Cigar Club in the house. Hey, those guys are coming up. Are they? I'm Jack. Are they really? Uh, yeah. Oh. Frank is over here on Newbies. It says Brandon is now live on. I know. I don't know so, why it does that. Yeah. Chris, what's up? Once we get going, things start getting crazy and but i'm gonna set my deal there so that i can how's our it turns the look frame all sideways and what jacky. does 10 seconds 10 you seconds oh, you should hold all those cigars in your hands i should now you got five seconds three seconds two seconds one second hey we have a lot of cigars in our hands tonight <laughs> for a, a plethora of reasons what's up it is Cigars 101, 101, Brought to you by Bush Bavarian. Bavarian. If you're going to drink a beer when you're smoking a cigar, make it Bush, Bush Bavarian. Bavarian. And if anyone, again, we the, the call is out. If anybody knows anybody at Bush Bavarian, please them let them know that... Uh, we are here promoting the shit out of their product. Man, you know how many... Look at all the berries? people you got coming in. Hey, Cigar Newbies, let's catch up to what's going on on the Facebook. What's um, up? Anthony White is in. Brandon Brewer is in. JY Lil Mama's in. What? Yeah. Um, look, there's one thing we're going to do tonight because I just had um, a little bit of dinner that had a little bit of did, sauce on it. Did you eat burgers? No, I did for lunch. No. Um... So we should be it should, we should be sponsored by Wolf Burger. That would be awesome. Yeah. Anyway, so here's a little uh, tip of the day for you on cigars 101. This is actually to cleanse your palate. This is dark chocolate uh, caramel with a little sea salt on it. But anything dark chocolate, nutty, but uh, emphasis on the chocolate that will clean your palate off really, really good. And, and I will take over from there because we will explain to you why you should not eat while the camera is rolling because you sound like you got molasses stuck to the top of your mouth. Molasses? But if you do have anything that is acidic for dinner and you're going to smoke a cigar afterwards, make sure to clean your palate. Topo Chico works well. Uh, chocolate works exceedingly well. And it's just a great... An acidic as in tomatoes. Tomatoes. But anything truly lemon... Uh, mm -hmm. If you have acidity on your palate, get rid of it. Before so if you, you go have a margarita and chips and salsa, yep. you're a candidate for chocolate. Exactly right. <laughs> and Sean Ratz is right. Sanders As always. sea salt chocolate caramels are freaking awesome. They are awesome. They're perfect. Because you just eat one of them, you get it through, and then you move on to the next. And let's move on to what we're going to be talking about, which is why is a cigar worth more than another one. 
What that's would a, what would you say to you from what you've seen and what you know mm -hmm. would be the number one element of why one cigar is more expensive than the other? We're going to go through many different reasons here, but one of which is what overhead. Oh, Man, you went straight at it. I went straight at it. I'm going. I'm going in hard. Um, the there. First of all, cigars are not a very profitable thing. It's not like you know, going to Starbucks and getting a cup of coffee that the cup costs more than the coffee that's going in it, but all in, they got a quarter into the whole deal and they're selling it to you for $5. Yep. Cigars are not like that. Um, it's actually, by the time we give discounts and by the time we pay for shipping and by the time we, we pay 3% for our credit card to be charged and pay 3% for your credit card to be charged, there's just, there's not a lot of margin in it. But... If you've ever smoked a cigar that maybe you've not heard of it, we have several cigars in our shop that have uh, gotten a lot of people's attention, and it's ten or twelve dollars. And then they smoke a let's just throw start throwing out some mass-produced name brands: Rocky, Rocky, Perdomo. You could go with the Underground line from Drew Estate, Drew Estates, uh, Fuente, lower line stuff. I was looking through uh, Airline Magazine that we get sent to the house for some reason. And Pete Johnson with Tatuaje, he's got a full page ad in every magazine. So um, the way that echoes out is you got to pay for those ads. It, it, it's, it all has cost. So I've had situations where I've smoked a $10 cigar of theirs and a $10 cigar of one that doesn't, isn't stacked with overhead. And the one thing that, that you get with that $10 cigar it's not stacked with overhead is typically a $10 cigar mm -hmm. not a $5 cigar with a whole bunch of overhead stacked on it uh, to make it $10 so um, that is a major major indicator that's why a lot of our most successful brands we deal directly with the owners in cases like principal they they actually fly from the Dominican to the DFW gets through customs and we go pick it up it's not like it's going through distribution and 14 reps and everything else that, got, that they got to pay commissions. And for. why that really makes a difference for us is because let's look at electronics. Electronics, you can have a ton of overhead with sales staff and brick and mortar stores and all of these things. But ultimately, your product could be substantially better because of technology than something else. Right. You could have a television substantially better than the others. But cigars, there's really very little technology. And really when it comes to a consumable, probably as little technology as any consumable on the planet. There is tobacco. Most of these factories and most of these farms don't use machinery. Right. right. Other than to maybe just to till. Maybe. But then the rest of the farming is done by hand. You have something that's here. So when you start stacking up overhead on top of overhead to grow the company, good on you. You have to grow a business. Mm -hmm. But you do start getting away from being able to provide ultimate value to your cigar smoker. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's where really a big difference is that technology and the you, the consumables that are going out are different. But when it's just a cigar, it's just the tobacco, the process, the people, the everything. Mm -hmm. Overhead is a big deal. Overhead's a huge deal, and you know. I I mean, frankly, I mean, look at our business. If we didn't do anything, if we didn't provide any service, if we didn't have 200 megabyte Wi-Fi, if we didn't have eight direct TV boxes, state-of-the-art air purification, if basically we were like every other shop, mm -hmm. um, our overhead would be rent and utilities. Rent and utilities. But yeah. ours is not. I mean, we we spend more money on just bringing in Cokes and, and uh, potato chips than we spend on our energy bill, which is crazy. So... Um, all of those things are their costs that impact the, the ultimate price. Everybody in here is in one form of business or another, and they make their living off the profit, the profits that their company makes. So everybody understands there's cost structure, but in cigars, the, the idea of just developing a cigar to hit a price point, typically large volume manufacturers are out to hit a price point. Yep. And a lot of them have actually a three or four year strategy. If the cigar works well, then their strategy is to creep their price up three to 5% per year, sometimes multiple price increases per year in order to get to where they ultimately want to be if they find that they have a winner. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's some cigars that I can think of out there that 
that a lot of people got it and it was like, man, at, at seven bucks, this cigar is spectacular. Three years later, it's nine, ten dollars, and it's like I don't know what happened. Right. But um, you and, know, those are all things that are part of that game. You're exactly right. So how do you, sitting on the other side of the lens, how do you pay attention and keep yourself from getting stung by spending too much money on a cigar that may come from a manufacturer that has that you're really paying for their ad budget, and it's just that open up cigar aficionado top twenty five. Not every one of them has advertised to get in there. But just know a fair chunk of them, mm -hmm. just truly putting it the way it is, a fair chunk of those cigar manufacturers that are sitting in that top 25, they're also going to have a full page ad in that same edition. Right. It, that's, we've, we've all shopped, we all have things, we have hobbies, and inevitably when you see a story about your favorite manufacturer, somewhere in that magazine there's going to be a full page ad. That's what makes the world go around. They'll be happy to write a story on you as long as you're running ads. But there are some of the top 25 lists out there and you kind of have to pay attention to either the banner ads that are on their website or the ads that are in the magazine and then go, oh, okay, because the cigar itself and where it ranks, it, like I've seen now they've done five through 10, I think on Cigar Aficionado the last two days. Mm, man, but it's the, mm. I will tell you though, because this is a little bit like finding out Santa Claus isn't real. However, there is one that's put out every year called the Census by Half Wheel. Yeah. The Census basically goes to all of these top different rating sites and publications, mm -hmm. and they, they curate all of those ratings and then basically average it out right. and give points to it. Create the consensus. So yep. that way, oh, the consensus, the that's consensus, right. And yeah. you get to see these that go across many manufacturers. Now, Ultimately, if you're smoking a cigar and you're enjoying it, that's the most important thing. That's so. That's it. Try it, smoke it, and it's a good way to see what's there and what isn't. So one thing that is very important with the, with why one cigar may cost more than the other is overhead. Mm -hmm. What would another thing be that you see? Um, oh, actually, before you do that, Sean Rats, we had that spammer that was on uh, Cigar Newbies. 2D cigars, yeah, yeah, $2 yeah. cigars. Yeah. How does he make money? I don't know. He probably gets them. You can tell none of them have any labels. None mm. of them have packaging. He ships them in bundles. They're probably shit cigars off the factory from some dickhead that doesn't know what he's doing. And they probably get them at about 10 cents a cigar, sell them for two bucks, and let it fly. Yeah. He's a pretty good troll, I got to say. Yeah. If you want to see a great troll, hop on some of these cigar groups. Uh, 2D cigars. That 2D cigars is a good troll in these. Uh, Kenny this, Frank is <clears throat> up. This jack wagon that's out selling these um, knockoff Brizard cases. That the way they're promoting it is, I got mine for seventy five percent off. Check out their website. Then you look on nineteen sites, and the guy's doing the exact same thing everywhere. Yes. Um, How do by they the make way, money? And then, they probably don't. And it, and it and you click on the link, and it takes you to a site that is a Chinese importer. That's just you're buying direct from like Alibaba, and they're sending the thing to you. Yeah, so, yeah. so one is is overhead. What's something else that would help draw that would maybe draw up the price of a cigar versus drop it back down? Sometimes it's just paying for the mental health of some of your customers. I gotta clean that window now. <laughs> Uh, that's Doug Heiser, HI Agency. HI insurance. Agency, yeah. If you I, saw him, you would cancel all your insurance. To me, another thing that will help drive up the price, but in a very good way, is how they treat their people. Yeah. Now, this is an expense that many manufacturers take on. Placenti is one of them that does it right. Drew Estate is another one that does they it right. They do, yeah. There are a number of manufacturers. Ahoya, in, Ahoya to Nicaragua was I'll, very, very good to their on, people. On the other side of things, some of these manufacturers that have ad budgets also can afford to pay good wages to their rollers and provide great mm -hmm. facilities. Some can afford, but don't anyways. But if you look at, at farmers like Placencia or manufacturers like Placencia, they treat their people right. And that is, that is an expense that goes in the form of building churches, mm -hmm. building schools. Transportation to the factories. Transportation mm -hmm. to the factories, setting aside funding in case something happens to the roller. That's paying them better. That's creating facilities that have air conditioning, which most Latin American homes and, and businesses, most, mm. especially factories, don't have air conditioning. 
that's as simple as wiring the place to have music. All of these things, and, and even installing and creating kitchens and cafeterias in the factories. The healthcare, healthcare, childcare at the factories. You know, those were the things that impressed me at some of the factories. Some of the factories that we went to, you know, you find out real quick, you're in a third world country and they're treating people like they're in a third world country and you should be lucky to make the $35 a month that you're making to roll cigars. And it's, it's uh, they're not allowed to engage. They're not allowed to have fun. It's just, they're not allowed to, you know, when you go to some of these factories and they're like telling the roller, here, get up and show these guys how to roll. That's different than not allowing a guy to even look up and smile at you when you walk by, walk through the factory. So Here, here's a, so let's just go ahead, Joe, and just for everyone who's watching, if you have questions, feel free to tag them in. We appreciate you taking your time on a Tuesday night to join us. Cigars 101, why are some cigars more expensive than others? Joe asked, so I've been a lot, I've been smoking a lot of Opus lately. In your opinion, what would be an accurate price for the product they're selling? Say a Power Range, say a Power Ranger, which if I remember, sell around $15. An oh. Opus Power Ranger? I don't remember that. Yeah, I don't know that one. But let's just say, uh, let's typically, say Opus... typically, what Opus sells their stuff for um, is typically thirty. Now, we're we're almost intergalactic at this point, so there is going to be some parts of the country that are affected by tobacco tax. In Texas, we're not. But typically, in the the most of the Opus larger ring gauge, larger cigars are going to be in that twenty eight. Uh, $35 range and then they've come out with some new ones like they're doing this new charity pack um, It's like pink Something or other, but those are starting to leak out there right now mm -hmm. There's a big you know to me opus is like Blanton's in the in the bourbon area You got a lot of guys chasing it and you got a lot of guys chasing it And they're not really sure if they like it or not But in some cases some of these guys get it and go holy shit. This thing is pretty strong but um you know, I think uh, Opus is one of those things. There is a big secondary market on it. They do some uh, projects that we actually really, really endorse and support, which is their charity programs that they do where they take really beautiful uh, travel humidors and humidors, you know, beautiful lacquered humidors, and then put rare Opus 2015, you know, five-year-old Opus in those. That are cigars that you just can't get. This is not one, but one shaped like this, which is called a BBMF. Um, cigars like that that are $75. Is it a $75 cigar? Man, not in my book, but however, a lot of money goes to back to the, um, to the Dominican Republic to do some good things. So we're, we're all in for supporting that type of stuff. There are a number of different organizations that are out there. There's cigar manufacturers that are taking a buck a stick and giving it to, um, you know, police federation and, and to support families that, um, you know, had somebody killed in the line of duty or so whatever the case so may be. Back up to the question. Joe asked, what do you think the accurate price is for for an opus? And to be honest, I, I think they've done a good job of understanding what the what the market price mm -hmm. is, what secondary is much more. Uh, the story of opus is incredible and I won't bore everyone by talking about it, but the story of the opus is just fantastic of just true tenacity. I think the price point of where they sit, especially with the, with what we have in there, I think it's an accurate price point. That yeah. upper 20s, lower 30s, yep. knowing the production numbers are low, knowing the quality is there, knowing that they they really invested a ton of time, energy, and, and dollars mm -hmm. into bringing it to life. I would say it's an accurate price worth. Yeah, price. it's, you know, I think one of the big things for them is they were able to create a wrapper that wasn't really something that could be created in the Dominican. And they did a great job with that. So we are. Um, so now we're talking into some of the other elements that make a cigar more expensive than the other, mm -hmm. and what we're rolling into is the tobacco they're using, the raw product and raw. No cost. doubt about it. You want to talk just a little well, bit about? Let, you know, we, we talk about the tobacco plant, and the tobacco plant in it of itself kind of has three zones: Seco, Viso, and Lijero. Lijero at the top, typically smaller leaves at the top broader leaves at the bottom. They're picked at different times throughout the process. Um, but a lot of times the plants, the, the leaves that are at the bottom, they're called primings. Within that region, that third, 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 there's an upper and lower part or priming. Just look so, at, if you hear the word priming, it's basically floors. It's basically first floor, second floor, third floor, fourth floor. 
based on where the leaf is. Right. right. First, second, third, fourth. Right. So higher priming, more nutrients in the plant, maybe a little bit smaller leaf itself, so it's not going to go as far. So imagine you're going to go, you're going to take all that bottom number one priming leaf off. Huge leaf is actually going to be kind of a muddy, earthy flavor because for the most part, the nutrients have come from the ground and have gone to the top of that plant. So there's not a lot going on in the bottom plant. They're larger. And because in the case of like Nicaragua, where they've got a rainy season from May to October, um, the mud splashes up on that leaf and, and will kind of impregnate that particular leaf and it's going to get a little bit more earthy. Well, that leaf by the pound is probably the cheapest to buy that's going to go them that's going to fill the majority of the cigars right it just doesn't have a ton of flavor but as you get into the these fourth and fifth primings as you go up the 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 three different steps now you're talking about this difference of you know kind of like there's usda beef and then there's prime and as you work your way up the top you're going to start getting the better leaves well that on a cost per, let's say, leaves per um, a, a unit of measure, call it a ton, there's going to be a cost of that. The range in cost between those regions or between those zones on that plant can range dramatically. So when you have somebody that is, I'm going to say like a Patoro, like Atabe or Byron, our particular cigar, Principal, a lot of these guys are using that top number four priming, number five priming on each one of these plants. And it's noticeable in the flavor, it's noticeable in the complexity, it's noticeable in the body of the cigar. I've taken some cigars recently that were, I would put them in the mass produced category, high volume category. It's They're all names you've heard of, trust me. And smoked them, and if you get past the fact that they stuck kind of a a leaf in there to get you maybe a, a pretty heavy splash of pepper. If you just kind of concentrate and scoot the pepper aside, man, there is nothing going on in these cigars. Yeah, that's what I've really noticed. And so you talk about the tobacco they're using and where it's from in the plant is important to the overall cost. The more flavorful leaves are at the top, but they're smaller, so they're lower yield. It's just all supply and demand. Now, take that one particular leaf where we talk about where it's from, mm -hmm. important, extremely important. Mm -hmm. Now, where that leaf is from and where that tobacco plant is planted. Right, where it's, where it's grown is huge. So, things that are, and, and really, if you look at different areas, in, for instance, in Nicaragua, you have an island called Ometepe. There are four growing regions in Nicaragua. One is Ometepe. Ometepe is very unique because it's an island in mm -hmm. the middle of a lake. But because of the political area, there are only two families that are really available to go out and farm on this island. Mm -hmm. Not to mention, on this island, there are jaguars. So there's literally, you could die farming this stuff. So and, and what's crazy is, it's a freshwater lake that has sharks. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, it, it's, it's really an anomaly, but when you look at it, it becomes very, it's dangerous to get there, it's difficult to get it through. You have to transport it via boat and then onto, onto trucks. And you start looking at all these different elements where you have to start bringing in more resources. More resources through the process come out to become more and more dollars. Well, really at this point, when they're at raw cost, we're not talking dollars at this point because of, because of the yield. But where the, it's at is mm -hmm. very important. So are there areas that you know of that the tobacco is naturally more expensive or have an idea of some types of tobaccos maybe that if, yeah. you, if you hear it, is there something that's more expensive to you? Well, I think, um, I, you know, one of the things that I do know is the particular uh, Ecuadorian Connecticut wrapper that Atabay uses is one third, the one leaf that goes around that, that cigar is one third of the cost of all of the tobacco that's in that cigar. So those cigars are typically about 30, call it 30 to $33. You're talking about one wrapper that's $11 of that. So to give you an idea of how substantial that is, you're talking one third of the price, right? One third. This, 
one leaf, that one little leaf, that wraps is that a, cigar is a third of the price, and this is nothing. It's a quarter of a tissue paper, mm-hmm. and it's a third of the cost of the cigar. Right. So, so there are certain. This is so not you a take, good cigar, by the way. That's no. that's why I'm you take it. you take a Connecticut a Connecticut seed, grow it in Ecuador in a, a prime growing region, and you create some really really special tobacco. Um, when Question. I hear of Question coming in here real quick because this might go to what you're talking about. Uh-huh. Sean Ratz asks, what regions are currently producing the best, most consistent tobaccos that when it comes to your mind? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, there are there's there are a couple of regions in the DR. Um, one of them, obviously, where, where the Reyes family is growing, where Davidoff is growing their tobacco, where Patoro is getting their tobacco. Uh, Henry Kellner is getting his tobacco that's used in the house stick. Um, uh, phenomenal tobaccos. I I think when you talk about Ometepe, uh, Condega, Condega in, is in, in Nicaragua, all areas that the soil could take the same seed and grow it maybe in Esteli and then grow it in Condega in, in Nicaragua, same seed. It's just going to taste totally different. And, and I don't know necessarily, Sean, if the the... The way to ask that is what regions are growing the best, most consistent tobacco, or which farmers. Which farmers. And I think it's really which farmers. And those there are a lot of farmers. Casa Torrent is a perfect example. In Mexico, great, great example. they've been growing since 1880. The, the Placencia family has been growing since 1865. Very substantial amount of time. We are talking generation mm-hmm. after generation after generation of only tobacco tobacco producers and farmers before they became rollers of cigars. That is really what's going to give us the most understanding of the process of what goes in there. Uh, and those who are just joining in, Charlie, Aaron Mansfield. What's up, Aaron? Um, hey, Aaron. Just want to say thank you guys for watching us. This is our Tuesday shop. Uh, Tuesday at the shop, Cigars, Cigars 101. 101. Tonight we're talking about what makes a cigar cost what it costs. Speaking of phenomenal cigars for a great value, these are the Crux Cigars. This is the Guild Robusto. This is the once available, not available now, and still in the OG Limitada wrapper called the Gunner. We're going to give these away. Uh, just share this, tag a friend below, ask a question. At the end, we're going to uh, pick one. And you know, do that. but one of the things that you brought up is the farmers that have been farming for a long time, they know their fields like the back of their hand. There are some farmers that as they break out and plot out their acreage, they know that there is a specific area of 30 or 40 acres that just grows the best tobacco. There's, there's a farm in Nicaragua where, you know, they have a rainy season and there's a kind of a creek that runs through the edge of this uh, property on the edge of the tobacco farm. Right. But when they have the monsoon season, it comes out of the banks. What's up, Travis? And then when that comes back in, all of that nutrients and the silt and everything has come in and they can till that in and make that that soil so much more um, nutrient rich. And when we talk about nutrients, nutrients are what's driving the flavor of that tobacco. So think about this, when they grow that plant, once that plant hits about this high, they actually cut it out of the ground and move it to another part of their field because the nutrients that have been pulled up out of that out of the ground. Importantly, because tobacco plants are, they hog the soil. They absolutely hog it. And when he says they pick them up, they literally pick them up, root and all, and they transplant them to a different plot of land by hand. Manually. Then they place the tobacco plants and imagine a cornfield that gets picked up and moved and, and transplanted replanted to a another. couple hundred yards away. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So Kenny Frank is saying he's falling in love with the CAO, Amazon, Basin, mm-hmm. Anaconda. So if you look about, if you look at the CAOs, mm-hmm. if you want to talk about nutrient and nutrient rip, rich soil, if you get to that, especially at CAO, something that's got a ton of flavor, a ton of yeah. oil, this richness, you are really going to get into what is nutrient very yeah. nutrient rich and and with with the cao like the amazon basin and some of those when you start talking about taking upper primings of the upper part of the plant and you start using that as wrapper binder 
it's gonna, it, it, you know, that nutrient goes up to the top, it builds the corona flower at the very top of the plant. The corona flower holds all the seeds. And then below that, that all those nutrients just hang in the top of that plant. And those are typically, typically gonna end up finishing with that shiny, like oily, this, actually, heavy. I'm looking yes, at this. there's a great example. And hopefully this translates on camera but you can really see on this cigar how glassy it looks and mm. and how much is there one you're you're asking what's the best selling full body cigar at industrial i think you're right sean rats the crux and bear is a full body cigar that doesn't smoke aggressively it was our number one cigar of last year sensational cigar really full very nice yeah the the tabernacle does extremely okay. extremely well so we're talking about the price of a cigar mm -hmm. what makes a cigar expensive we're talking about the tobacco we're talking about the region we also talk about availability of tobacco because of the region deal. this is a perfect example of all three of these coming together this is called the tabernacle this is by foundation cigars and this utilizes a tobacco called Pennsylvania Broadleaf. It's mm -hmm. either Pennsylvania or Connecticut Broadleaf, what they broadleaf. use. So they use a Broadleaf, which is, a, as, you would, as you would anticipate, it's a bigger, broader tobacco mm -hmm. that they then have to plant further apart because it does become bigger and it, and it zaps the soil out. Mm -hmm. But it's also in a place in the United States where there's a lot of freezing, a lot of variance in, in the temperatures. So some years they could have a great deal of it some years some years they don't they don't and you we've just we're just on the heels of of a poor couple seasons of broadleaf and with that we're starting to get the broadleafs back in but it's a it's a cigar that it's a type of tobacco rather from a region which help which actually drives a price up on it because you just can't get the tobacco right and and Pennsylvania broadleaf um, there's also Connecticut broadleaf uh, but Pennsylvania Broadleaf, in and of itself, a lot of manufacturers started using that on this quest to say, hey, look at me, I'm making the strongest cigar in the market. And Pennsylvania Broadleaf, stacked on top of a bunch of really, really heavy-bodied uh, tobaccos, did just that. Um, and, Nick and, and Sean Ratz is saying exactly where you're at. Is He used to be a big fan of the Rocky Broadleafs, but the consistency fell off because... The tobacco just didn't exist. Right. So, and with, with a lot of these guys, you know, here's, here's something a lot of people don't know. Drew Estates does an astronomical amount of business. Here's a, here's a question for you guys. Um, Drew Estates does Liga. They do Undercrown. They do Willie Herrera stuff. They do all kinds of products. And they do assets. What percentage of Drew Estates' business comes from assets? Now you know the answer to this. I don't you were know at the, the factory. I don't know the number. I can't remember the number. It's a big number. We, yeah, let's just throw that but, out there. So, um, <coughs> but what's interesting is they don't grow any tobacco. I mean, we we went to their facilities. They buy from brokers, and a lot of companies buy from brokers. They'll go out, they'll test the tobacco, they'll look for what what various farmers are doing. We have a tendency to position ourselves. The, the Placencia family, they make their own cigars, which are spectacular. They make Regis, yep. which is spectacular. They make Cavalier out of their Honduras factory, and they make Crux. And what's interesting is you could smoke all of those cigars and really have no idea that they're all coming from the same factory. Yep. You know it's all quality. You know that it's rolled well. You know that the performance is there, but it just shows you that then when you put the right tobacco in the hands of the right blender they, they can make work. i mean when you can take nicaraguan tobacco and make it taste like a cuban like they did with the regis black label it's it's absolutely incredible what these guys can do so kenny frank thinks 80 percent of the business for drew estate comes from swisher um andre says drew estate i suspect rebands a lot of the same cigars you know, it's not that they reband a lot of the same cigars. It's just when you're dealing with brokers, you have limited amounts of different mm. tobacco to hit the quantities you're looking at. So just think of that. If if we, for instance, when we work with principal, we say we need 10,000 cigars. Well, that's pretty damn easy to find 10,000 cigars worth of tobacco. If we're Drew Estate and we're going to the, we say for the Cuba Cuba, we need enough tobacco for 8 million cigars a month. 
now the percentage of yields are going to start whittling down. It's, it, it, you know, it's, I, I used to call on Walmart and, you know, Walmart at one point really could care less what it was or what it cost. The question was, can you fill all of our stores shelves on a consistent basis? If the answer is yes, you're in. And in this case, if somebody's going to do a boatload of product and sell it through the channels of distribution that Drew does, then you have to go to all the brokers that you can to get that tobacco. We're blessed that we have a number of manufacturers that take a different approach. Some of those approaches are so, really... With that, Why don't you stop me mid-thought maybe one more time? No, no, no. Because I'm going to kill you. Oh, do you not like that? Oh, because, no, I love it. I love I'm, losing my train of thought. But I I'm, already linking, have I'm linking. This is good. I'm, okay. It's... This links very well because you're talking about the different manufacturers and using the smaller manufacturers, and it actually rolls into Chris to Chris's question, which is, what are some of the three, what three manufacturers that we deal with would you recommend to somebody who's on who's new to the boutique world, mm -hmm. and then why does that translate to working with the smaller ones versus working with the larger ones? Well, obviously, uh, Placencia. Is yes. Rodney would, Smith, what's up? Uh, Placencia for sure. Um, Henry Kellner doesn't really, he doesn't grow his own tobacco. He just, he goes and finds some of the best stuff that you can possibly get in the world. It's just never enough to make a huge volume of cigars. Mm -hmm. What are some of the factories that you could think of? If I'm looking at three brands that people really need to pay attention to, to boutique cigars, I would, I would go Principal, Patoro, Crux. Those are cigars yeah. within Principal, Patoro, and Crux. You could find a cigar from seven dollars to twenty-five, thirty dollars. Thirty dollars. Yeah. You could run the entire spectrum within those three lines and see what the difference is of small level, small production levels, and what that quality and how and, you get to. And it. the Patoro brand is actually the Reyes family, and you've met the Reyes family. Um, the Reyes family in the Dominican is also one of the best growers of tobacco. Just do, they do an incredible job. Um, they're kind of across the road, if you will, from Davidoff. Um, but there's, you know, there's a perfect example when you talk about the boutiques. You know, to go get a cigar that's 25 or $30, the beauty of the companies that you just talked about, they don't have massive, over, massive overhead. So their $30 cigar is one you have to compare to Davidoff's $100 cigar or $150 cigar or a $100 Opus because that's the impact that, that overhead has. I would rather get, if I'm smoking a $30 cigar, I want $30 worth of cigar. I don't want to spend $100 to get $30 worth of cigar. I and that's what happens in a lot of these I completely, situations. I completely agree. And I just want... I may talk. I want to talk numbers here for just a second because it, it's it's important to to talk about when you talk about what are some other elements that bring up the price mm -hmm. of your cigar and really packaging and production are big elements to that because <clears throat> let's just look at a label for instance a label you're going to buy at a clip of about a half million to a million bands at a time. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do one one set of blends, you need to commit to about a million dollars worth, a million bands at least, right. in order to, to get that to break down. And you're talking roughly in the ballpark of 22,000 per million, mm -hmm. depending on the production quality. So yes, that only works out to be about two cents a band, or less than two cents a band. But what that does is, it's a $22,000 check for a band. right? And then you get into the boxes. The boxes that are being produced for a, fa for a company, I have an idea, are about $15 a box. Mm. For just a box. For a Basic box, box, for 20 cigars to sit in. Mm -hmm. That has to go through. They all have their own bands. They all have that. They then get into cellophane. Mm -hmm. Then you get into transportation. Well, let's talk about somebody's got to put a label on it. Somebody's got to put it into cellophane. Somebody's got to put all those decals on the box. Somebody's got to wrap that up and shrink it, get a UPC code. All of those things go into that. 
And some of these retailers, these big mass merchant, big box guys, if you don't have a UPC code on your cigar, foundation does it, they won't bring it in. Yep. Um, yep. You know, and that's, and that's just, that's all added expense. You're exactly right. So the actual core cost of a cigar of the raw tobacco could be 25 cents. It could be 50 cents. In some cases for nicer cigars, it could be $4. But that's just the beginning of the story. That really doesn't talk about the people. That doesn't talk about the process. It doesn't talk about actually rolling. And so that's another element. Production, printing, packaging, those are added costs that go into the cigar that are extremely important because if you there's probably a cigar in the cigar lounge that you go to whether it's here or somewhere else you've probably walked past it a hundred times because there's nothing inviting about that mm -hmm. it's just they they all need to be fishing lures and tell the story in a right classy way so you can't just cheap out on it now it also goes into production and we talk about the different sizes and shapes, and you talk about the Lancero. Mm -hmm. What are some other things that might require or cost more, maybe on the rolling table, that echo out to be more expensive for our end? Well, end in a, it, this is this is a this right here is a Crux. This is a Robusto. The Robusto Vitola is the most popular size in the world. This is what most Cuban Cuban cigar sizes. Uh, this is what sells. But imagine this, the roller's got to roll, what, one of these a minute? Roughly. Uh, yeah, roughly, roughly one of these a minute. This is a Jake Wyatt. That is not going to get rolled in one minute. No. It is, um, this is what is called a, a figurado shape. This takes extra work, extra time. This, you can't really see it, but it's barber pole with two colors. It has a fantail at the top. Absolutely beautiful cigar. This is a $26 cigar. It's worth $26. And the same looking cigar through Opus is a BBMF, which is $75. Um, but this cigar, if we went to this factory and said we want to make this, they may tell us this is going to be a, a couple of bucks. This isn't. No. It so just... it depends on what kind of messaging, what your brand imaging, what your branding efforts are going to be. We have Cavalier. They actually put 14 karat gold on the cigar itself. They don't need to, but that is their branding element on that on that cigar. And it's important to say, because they are with the right partnership, just because they put 14 karat gold foil on there, it doesn't mean that takes a cigar that was going to be $8 and makes it $14. No, 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 no that, it is still a very small detail. However, there's, there's R&D costs of how do you get, and you guys, if you're watching this, go to our YouTube channel and watch the ICCU with Sebastian de Copet. He is the owner of Cavalier, and he talks about <clears throat> the production and the story about how the hell do you get this skull foil to stick to tobacco, which it sticks to everything but tobacco. Right. So they have to cut it, and that's all cut and then placed. So it's just an additional cost, which on the rolling table may only cost an extra penny. Right. But as that echoes out over tens of thousands of cigars, it goes through the production, it turns into time value money where it's, that takes an extra minute to roll. Well, that's another minute in another cigar they could right. produce. And that's why at some factories that we went to in Nicaragua, for example, there's, there's a, a rolling table. And at that rolling table, there's typically a man and a woman. The man is the buncher. He's the guy that's rolling the cigars. He's putting the tobacco together. He's bunching it, rolling it, putting it in a press, and he's putting it in the vise. The woman is um, doing the wrapper. At a couple of the factories we went to, they all wear a smock, like a, a rolling smock. A different color smock, that guy was the boss. And one stood in front of each rolling table. So each one of these guys that had a blue vest on or a smock on was sitting in front of each table. And his only job is to make sure that they do not slow down. Now, speed is not your friend. It is if you're trying to fill an order for, you know, fill in the blank big box. But when you look at companies like Atabay that will only allow their rollers to roll 75 cigars a day, perfectly. And how do you know it's perfect? Another cost, draw testing. 
that is that draw testing and mm -hmm. if you want to if you want to yeah. just run through what that is but just imagine every time you roll you do the you do the full press you fill the mold you get it ready to go okay it's ready for the press no it isn't somebody gets up they walk it over to the draw tester they give it to the draw test master and then what do they do with that the draw test is basically this tube that has an opening that you slide the cigar in without the wrapper on it. They slide the cigar in, it's still open on the foot. It clamps down, they push their foot, it sucks air through this because of this airtight seal. It pulls air and it measures in PSI. If it's 40 PSI to 60 PSI is the acceptable range of airflow for that manufacturer. If the needle falls between that, it's good. They put it back in the press and send it back to put a wrapper on it. If it's not, if it falls short, imagine 40 is going to be tight, 60 is going to be loose. If it's 30, they'll press it a little bit and try to squeeze it a little bit, stick it back in, give it another run. If that doesn't work, it gets set off to the side. Now here's the thing. Some manufacturers pay to have 100% of their cigars draw tested. Some will take one bunch out of a day's rolling and just test those. And some... Um, in Cuba, I went into the into their room that had draw testers. In this factory, six floors, making millions of cigars, one draw tester. Really? And she wasn't in a big hurry. So it yeah. was it was pretty pretty amazing. Now there's some factories that had a lot of draw testers that we saw, just a lot of them weren't being used. But if we go in to get a cigar made and we say we want 100% draw tested, there's going to be that cost. First as well. off, they're going to laugh at us. Yeah, you, because when he, when he says some manufacturers draw test one hundred percent, that's about zero percent. Right. It is very seldom, and it's not required that one hundred percent of your cigars are draw tested. And Atabe, that is just a key principle to go Atabe. with. Now, now what what I like what Osak does at Casa Turin is they actually do it. They understand based by weight to the gram exactly how much tobacco is in there that's mm -hmm. really going to show and then they're those. just counting on great rollers that are putting the cigars together exactly and, and you I, see I think you know one of the things that's interesting side channel on Atabe as we talk about draw testing one of the things that that Nelson Alfonso told us is while some manufacturers have a 20 psi acceptable range his is two two psi that's why they test everything he has a high scrap rate which is a big contributor to why that cigar is expensive but he believes that oxygen is one of the flavor components. Too much oxygen or not, or not, not enough oxygen flowing through the cigar will change the flavor from the way he blended it. So he has put that extra tolerance in there to make sure. Yep. It's no different than a race car driver's making sure his air pressure in his tires is perfect. And he is like that race car driver that can feel a one pound difference. He, oh, no doubt about uh, it. Rob, what's up? Michael, what is up? For those of you who are just joining us, this is Cigars 101. Why are some cigars more expensive than other? We've talked a little bit about overhead. We've talked about parts of the plant. We've talked about region. We've talked about availability, process, packaging. We've covered a ton of things here. If you have here, questions, please fire them through. Here is kind of that last step before it gets to the United States that impacts things dramatically, and it is export taxes. There are some countries, like uh, we all, maybe you've heard of Grey Cliff, which is made in the Bahamas. They have to, their, their cigars are a little pricey, although they have some stuff that they sell to mass merchant guys that's cheaper. <laughs> it's cheaper. But... When you go there to their factory, their cigars, while they're rolling them, $35, $40 US. The reason for that is they, pay, they have to pay an absorbent tax to bring product in from the Dominican or Nicaragua. Um, then they have to pay an absorbent tax to the island um, leaving, and then it's got to come into customs and duties, and then they're going to pay some kind of a tax when it gets to the state. So taxes... Think about this. We went to when we went to Nicaragua. We're thinking we don't even need to take cigars with us. I mean, shit, they make them there. We're going to get cigars on every street corner. Uh huh. Couldn't find them. No, nope, could couldn't. not find them. The reason for that is if you're a manufacturer and you decide that you're going to sh export your cigar, your cigars, if you decide to sell it in country, it flips the switch and you now have to pay an absorbent tax in Nicaragua. Yeah. So much so that we could only find one brand 
and we had to buy the cigars in a restaurant. The Olays. The Olays, yeah. That, yeah. And we had to buy them in the restaurant. And I know, I remember when we toured that factory, that uh, that was the one where they, we got to do the, the sampling oh, and we had yeah. the coffee and all that stuff. It was an awesome experience, but he was proud of the fact that he not only exported, but he paid the price in order to sell in uh, Nicaragua. Oh, so I forgot well. about that. That's cool. Yeah. Kenny Frank, I'm okay with five PSA. Just have Nelson send him the one that don't make specs. Yeah. You and me no, both, but, Kenny. Yeah. But, but let's go, touching back to the point you were talking about, why are some cigars less expensive or more expensive? We talked about what drives the price up. What drives the price down? You talked about that draw tester. Messes up, messes up. It's not there. It's not going back in. It's going to the left. The left has a different life afterwards. Mm -hmm. And many people probably get some sort of JR cigars or some sort of catalog that comes to you. You say, 60, 60 cigars for five bucks. What a deal. Yeah. God, that's great. What is going to drive cigar prices down? It's quality, it's production, is you're paying for their scraps. Very smart people of these big companies started figuring out people love a bargain and instead of just seconding these and giving them to the, to the workers, let's just make some money off of them. Yeah. So we'll bundle them, we'll throw them together, rock and roll. You could take 20 cigars, stick it in cellophane and sell it to CI for, let's say, eight bucks they'll sell them this factory seconds and it's a factory seconds of an alec bradley or they'll, they'll actually name who it is because that might have been that particular production run and then those guys are going to bring it over here and sell it for 30 bucks or, or whatever the case may be that stuff was heading for the shredder it was heading for the shredder and, and so they just turned they just turned trash into eight bucks yeah you're exactly or whatever right. the and, number and is and chris re-rolls to the left it takes a very very connected manufacturer to make them reroll. In all honesty, because most manufacturers don't have their own factories. Mm -hmm. So that factory needs to get rid of that tobacco and they get to make their decision. When that thing comes out to the left, am I as a factory going to take my personnel, bring them back, make it break that cigar down, rebunch it, repack it, retest it, mm -mm. or am I just gonna set that thing aside, get that thing out the door, call it a second, don't charge the manufacturer company, the actual brand of the cigars, mm. and just make some money off of it and just keep them going. Most will not re-roll, most. And, and I say this a Busy. lot. I say this, uh, I talk about this a lot. Here's what up, Biz? the unfortunate thing and for those of you guys that enjoy spirits, we have Rodney Smith in the house from Someone Say Whiskey. He's the man. He is the man. But the unfortunate thing is, is both of these cigars look the same. Now we test every cigar. We try them. We get to know the owners of the manufacturers. And when we go through the evaluation process and we can ask our friend Jay from Definition Cigars that we as the first vendor, we actually let him sit and watch us go through the evaluation process. We're asking him, which priming are you using? What growing area are you using? We want to know about the components inside that cigar so we can determine if it's a good value or if they went cheap. But if we had a shot of um, Blanton's or some of the super fancy stuff that Rodney puts into a little uh, Glencairn glass and you put a little Jack Daniels in it, to the average person, they both look the same. Right. They're not. Right. So these cigars, they look the same, but they're not. And that's the one thing. And it's... This, if this is $8 and you see this at a store and it's sitting next to this, it doesn't mean this is a better deal. It's a bigger cigar, but would I rather smoke this? In some case, this is a great cigar. It'll last you all day. Might last some people all week, but this cigar here, super complex. This cigar here, it's a big ass cigar. Because when we go back to the raw tobacco, and this is one thing that we haven't covered that's very important is just like beef, you have grades. Grade A, B, C, on, and some factories go further. But A, B, C, tobacco, every gringo that walks into the factory wants A, tobacco all the time. That's when I want it. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna pay for the A, tobacco. The factory and the farm still has B and C, tobacco. That they're, that's just sitting. Mm -hmm. They need to get it out of the factory so they can get new stuff in because more stuff's coming in. 
grows every day. So what they usually do in a full format cigar is, yeah, they'll get rid of some of that A, but that B and C is coming in. So if you see a massive cigar, a seven inch cigar that's big as a baseball bat, and it's $10, it's $12, it's okay. It doesn't mean it's bad tobacco, mm. but just know that your experience on that is going to be what you're paying for. Yeah. You're not, set your expectations. Set your expectations right and you'll be okay. Mm. Don't expect depth. Don't expect complexity and change and all of these wonderful things that you get out of a cigar. Really just put your expectations right. This big ass thing for $10, I mean literally, I think these two sit on the shelf at the same price. About the same price. This is the same price. And it's not that- An uneducated buyer or somebody that's walking in that's maybe a newbie is walking into the shop and the perception is I'm getting more for my money. And the, the, this is why we ask the question when you come in the shop, where, where do you want the cigar to take you? If you want, if you want a cigar to take you till nine o'clock and it's one, this is the cigar for you. But if you want a cigar, it's going to give you a nice, smooth, creamy, rich. That's something that a lot of that profile comes from that A-grade tobacco. Now, here's an AB because we're talking large format cigars. And if you want to talk about A, B, and C tobacco, I'm glad you grabbed this. Mm. This is about $10, $11. This is a principal Grand Pyramid. This is $25. That's the difference of this, virtually the same size cigar and the raw costs of grade A tobacco versus B and C tobacco. Mm -hmm. This is A, there is no B, C, and you will see that in the experience with the Grand Pyramid. Overall, it's going to be a, a more enjoyable. This, they're making 25 an hour. This, they make 25 a day. So that it is absolutely perfect. And, and it is, and it's an amazing scar, and this scar will take you three, three plus hours to smoke as well. But it's a beautiful ride and seven country blend and all the other goodies that come along with and it. And then ultimately, it comes down to the final element is the pricing structure of why one cigar would be more expensive than the other is the humidor. It finally makes itself to before you buy it. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's very important. And that's where it's very important to pay attention to... Let's just say the, the lounges, the websites, the fill in the blank of where you purchase from. It's very important because there is an industry standard pricing model mm -hmm. that, we, that we adhere to, that, that most other shops in the country adhere to. Cigar shops. Cigar mm -hmm. lounges adhere to. Our prices are on par with everyone else in the city, key to key, because we work under the same thing. Right. And our members receive a 15% discount, so they're buying better than most anybody. Mm -hmm. For some of those lines, if you go into a lounge that has, let's say every time you walk in, the first thing you see when you walk in is buy one, get one, or buy five, get three, or whatever. On any given day, you can walk in and buy three, get one, or whatever that, that is. It's because their margins are better from who they're buying with because they're not utilizing the best tobacco they can. Mm -hmm. They're they're cutting corners somewhere. So ultimately it may be, if that's what's important to you, then that's great. But also keep in mind, if you're buying cigars from a place that is consistently and constantly just discounting to get them out, they don't really give a shit about them. They just gotta get them out. Right. And if you're in a high sales promotion environment, that, that's something that may be a, a red flag. Yeah, I, I think, and you know, we're, I guess we're not politically correct here, but I, I've seen some guys actually post on newbies and talk about cigar bid and how their wife is going to kill them because they discovered cigar bid. Cigar bid is owned by CI. CI is owned by a conglomerate out of Scandinavia. But if you want to know what is not selling at retail or not selling in the catalog, it's on cigar bid. And they start their bidding at their cost. So they're going to get their cost back out, but they think if you can buy a five pack for 25 bucks, you're going to jump on that and you won the bid and oh my God, you notice there was nobody bidding against you. Um, every once in a while, somebody will go in and run it up or they'll drop a couple of name brand box. They'll drop a box of Liga in there once a week or whatever. But for the most part, what you're getting is an opportunity to see what really isn't selling. 
because they're they're all about the number. Um, we hope that all cigar lounges are more about the experience. We're about the experience and making sure that you get the best possible cigar you can for the money. It's it the volume takes care of itself, but if you get in the business to do volume. You can live by the volume, you can die by the volume. You can most certainly die by the volume. And it, and it is something that at those cigar lounges, and this is just, it's very important because the experience is, it, that is our number one most important thing here is creating community through the finest cigar lounge experience for all people. So what does that mean? The reason why you don't walk into the humidor and see see everything on sale for 15% below and this, that, the other. Now members get that because it's just an awesome perk and we love you, but it's because we have to turn around and make your experience better. Mm -hmm. Your experience means thousands of dollars a month on purification filter changes, on making sure that all the technology is up to date, making sure that your experience, if, if there are broken chairs, we spend $10,000 to get New the chairs. Bro new chairs and better. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we don't mark our price up because of where the location is. This is, I think this is, forgive me for this rant here, but this is important to say. We don't mark our price up. We're not more expensive because we're on the tollway, because we're in Frisco. We have the same prices mm -hmm. and the pr same pricing structure as the entire industry. But the reason why you don't see a ton of sales after sales is because we turn around and are able to put that back into the business and make it a better experience for you. Mm -hmm. And I hope the lounges that you visit also adapt that because your experience is more important than getting you 50 cigars for $4 and, and, and that's just the way it is. I, I, one of the things that people may be thinking to themselves is, if all these big mass volume distributors and manufacturers are out there selling B and C grade tobacco or worse, or selling scraps or selling factory seconds or whatever the case may be, they're all doing that and you're not. What, what's the difference? And here's the difference. When you have, if you take, let's say a mediocre cigar, you buy a bunch of ads or you buy placement to get the right position in uh, Cigar Aficionado's top 25, you, you have these big name brands. If you're in a humidor where nobody is planning on going in to help you, there's two things that are scientific facts. One, this is about men. Men don't ask for help. And if we've never heard of it, it must be no good. It could be electronics. It could be anything. It could be furniture. It could be watches. Doesn't matter. If we've never heard of it, it must be no good. So it's easier for them to just stack a bunch of cigar aficionados, top 25 boxes on the floor, let you go over and pick the stuff up. Somebody will come up and ring you up in the end. Bing, bang, boom, you're out the door. We will always go in the humidor with you. We will always ask you questions to make sure that we're getting a better idea of what you're trying to accomplish with your cigar. More importantly, um, we want to get to know what your palate is so that when guys like Kenny Frank come in, we can go, hey, we got the cigar for you. Got to yeah. give it a try. And the nice thing is, is most people here trust us. And they say, you haven't, gear, you haven't steered me wrong yet. Is Let's keep on going. Chris, where... Chris, where are you from? Do you know where Chris Coulter is from? I don't. He was over here. He went over there. Yeah, he hopped over here. Chris, where are you from? Are you are you in this area? He just he dropped a, a nice line. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That means the world to us. But I think you're exactly right. And this is <laughs> this is not this is not the industry to uh, to run up your bank account. But this is definitely no, one I, to absolutely enrich your life. I, I, you know, I think when we got when we started going into the business, there was a guy that uh, that I respect a ton in this industry that made a comment that really made a lot of sense. If you want to make a million dollars in the cigar business, start out with two, because it is not a business you're going to make a lot of money in. It's a business that you just have to be passionate about. And when we see and hear, I mean, we got a gentleman out front. He comes over three days a week, minimum, and he lives on the west side of Fort Worth. So it's a minimum hour, 20 minutes in order to get here. And he's here three days a week. He's here now. And, how many, and he's here now. But how many shops does he drive by on the way over here? Yeah. But, you know, if everywhere you go, you set expectations for what experience you want, 
look, if you want to if you want to buy it cheap, go someplace where they stack it high and watch it fly, and it just doesn't matter. But I'll tell you what, look, if you want if you walk in and you're on a budget, we can get you a cigar that's five dollars. Easy. That is stellar. That is brown and cellophane. I can get you a cigar from 2009, Butera. That's eight dollars, seven dollars. We we have that ability. We just got a cigar in today from 2002, and they're six dollars and forty nine cents. It's it's really cool what we have the ability to do, and and we couldn't do it without you guys, and and really appreciate it. But the main thing I think the biggest thing is just support the, the support that we receive from. All of these guys that are on this floor, from LFD to Tabernacle to Principal Crux, Osak, Placencia, um, Jake Wyatt, all of these guys that are that are, in, and of course our local guy, which is uh, Jamon with uh, Definition Cigars. He's doing a great job. So happy, so proud of these guys to see what they're doing and the support that they give us enable us to make sure that you guys have a, uh, an experience. Like yeah. that. I hate to have this sound. I mean, Cigars 101 is. <laughs> is to teach newbies and not to do a, a thirty-minute well, sales pitch on our company, but, but it is but there is a, it, at least it helps you identify what you look for if you're not in this area, what you need to look for as you go into some of these shops and challenge your shops and ask questions. Yep. And part of what we talked about on last week's show, if you didn't see it, go watch last week's show, which is kind of how to navigate uh, humidors and shops that you go into. Um, to find out what they're doing. Yep, you're exactly right. Kenny Frank, love you, appreciate you like crazy. You've been here since day one. Yep. We appreciate you. Chris, uh, these cigars are for you, Chris Coulter. If you're here, send me a message or send us a message. If you're in Frisco, come pick them up. If not, we'll send them to you. Um, good show. Stellar. That was, that was a really, I think. I'll tell you what, and I, just as an aside, the house stick that was created for us by Henry Kellner Jr., Henry Kellner Sr. is the master blender for Davidoff. Junior is not, he, Junior is my age, so um, he's not a young man, but the quality of our house stick is just spectacular. This new blend is so good. It's killer, and we are currently working on a house stick blend with Patoro. Yes. So I've been smoking exclusively Patoro to really get a good understanding of what kind of tobacco and experience we're working with. I'm smoking the red label. It's called the Gran Añejo Reserva. Dominican blend all the way through. Sensational. Good depth. So good, good body. This is... The Patoro cigars are really next now, level. You want to talk about something. These guys used a very unique leaf in this cigar that creates what's called an effervescent effect. What they were trying to simulate with the red label is what champagne does. You take in champagne, you feel it, you taste it, and it's gone. And I smoked probably three of those back to back, and I ended up calling up Patrick, the one of the owners of uh, Patoro in Switzerland, and I'm like, you have to explain to me what's going on with this. I cannot figure this cigar out. It's driving me crazy. And he started laughing at me. And he goes, it's not the flavor, it's the flavor, the flavor leaves your palate completely. Super clean. But he said there's one leaf in this cigar that creates this effervescent effect. So after you take the cigar in, you get experience the cigar, you release the cigar, you get this great taste, gone. It dissipates. And, and, it's, and now your palate is clean and ready to go for the next puff. It's, it is so good. Some of our guys like Reg Frazier is just buying the Churchill's by the box. Yep. And if you really want to treat yourself, and there's a couple guys on here I know, have done the Patoro XO. Very excited to announce that I'll have Patoro XO Bellicosos. When? They are going to start shipping at the end of the week in 10 count boxes. Oh, really? Yeah, because it's currently a $1,000 box because it's 30 in a box. But ten um, count, that's smart. Ten but a 10 count box is going to be fantastic. And the Bellicoso is the, the Salomon was in my top five I've ever smoked ever. And I think the Bellicoso's in that. I think you're right. I think you they're in for position there. That's well, that's it. For those of you who join us, thank you so much. Chris, please be sure to drop us your information on whether you're here in Frisco or elsewhere. Uh, this weekend, we have Cars and Cigars out yeah. front. Oh, actually, around the and building. You said there's a lot of cars that are already signed up and ready to come in. Yeah, as of, as of a couple of days ago, we had something like 50 cars. I think I counted... I think there was something like 10 Ferraris, a bunch of Lamborghinis, McLarens, a couple old classics. So there's nice. 
And a lady called in. There's going to be street tacos. So nice. Street tacos, breakfast tacos. Come get it. That's, that is uh, 9, 30, 10 o'clock on Saturday. Stretto Coffee will be in the house. Stretto Coffee will be here. And, and if you haven't come up for a Saturday, come up, watch, look at some cars, and come in and sit in the background and join us for Saturday at the shop, which is a full contact show, mm -hmm. and we have nothing but fun. You will learn nothing, um, but uh, you'll you'll have some fun watching us um, smack the shit out just of each smack other. the shit out of each other is basically all that yeah, happens on that's that show. It.